Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Business of Show events. How are you guys feeling today? Excited? Inspired? Ready to go? Fantastic. I am Kevin Brown, a partner with EY. Um, I either you know, work in the in New York City area with our social impact. So this is a big event for EY today. We are thrilled to have all of you and to have our front row guests here today, uh, each of whom in their own right are headliners, authors, global vice chairs, but they're all here today to serve us and to serve you in the spirit of allyship and diversity and inclusion. Um, before the agenda, I want to share with you our, our two big intentions for the event today, okay? Number one is, our goal is to have each of you leave today feeling inspired, right? Inspired to think differently about diversity and inclusion, and more so about your role and how you can act to change the world for a better place, okay? And number two, we want to have our guests here today understand how much we appreciate them being here today to serve us and this purpose. And I do want to ask all of our panelists and BTU folks to stand for a minute here and just be greeted by the team. Please, warm welcome for Tony Award winners, Broadway actors, pop stars, directors, producers, this front row is the number one A-list event in New York today. So thank you all for being here and for walking through. So the evening today will be covered in, in, in three parts. In the first part, you'll meet our very esteemed host today, uh, Shelley Williams, an acclaimed director, <laughs> actor, um, currently working on four upcoming hit plays, including Aida, Mandela, the Wiz and Hidden Figures, among other things. Herself, who has worked on Broadway in programs like Rents, etc. So you'll hear her very shortly walk you through the event for the evening. And then she will introduce our keynote today, which is Kenji Yoshino, renowned author, triple Ivy League graduate, uh, <laughs> produced <laughs> three books, and a very compelling uh, storyteller. And I think Kenji will move each of you to think differently about diversity, and you will hear his very compelling new thoughts on allyship, which is the new frontier of how diversity becomes very real for all of us as we go forward. When Kenji is through making us all smarter, then part two begins, and we'll go into our various teams panel, which is a mix of academia with, with Kenny, um, the business world with Karen, our global vice chair of diversity and inclusion here. Um, Right. Michael McElroy, a Tony Award honoree among many, many, many other accolades. Um, and Shelley. So as you can see, a very jam-packed and very compelling event today. And you will see the three angles come together. And again, the goal is very simple, to have you learn something new, be inspired, and be compelled to act and move forward. So, without further ado, on to the real talent today. I want to have Shelley come join the stage and grab the mic for us. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. On behalf of Broadway Theatre United, welcome. It is an honor to be here, and we are very grateful that you are in conversation with us today about being an ally to each other and to grow our allyship globally. Um, it is uh, an honor for me to introduce my dear friend and my colleague for many years, Kenji Yoshino. When we began Broadway Theater United, we talked a lot about our industry, and Kenji has been an extraordinary ally to our organization and been a great friend and ally to me for many years. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Black Theater United, <laughs> Black Theater United, thank you so much. I'm like, my gosh, BTU is what I, Black Theater United. Um, Kenji Yoshino is the T Chief Justice Earl Warren Profes Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law and Director of the Metzl Center of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, a graduate of Harvard, Oxford and Yale. He received tenure at Yale Law School, where he served as deputy dean before moving to NYU. Yoshino has published in major academic journals, including the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, and the Yale Law Journal. 
He is the author of three books. His fourth book, co-authored co with David Glasgow, Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice, was recently published in 2023. It's an amazing book, get it? He lives in Manhattan with his husband and two children and a great Dane. Please welcome Kenji Ishino. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for that incredibly kind introduction, uh, Shelley, and thank you to EY uh, for hosting today, and thank you most of all to Black Theory United. It's rare when the speaker, I think, is as starstruck by the first row of the audience uh, as I am today. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about allyship, which is a piece of uh, the book that Shelley was kind enough to mention. Uh, you'll see Vanessa's blurb on the back of this. Uh, uh, if you get it, it's called Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice. It was done with my co-author, David Glasgow, who is executive director of my center. And we style it as a practical, shame-free guide to navigating conversations about our differences in a time of rapid social change. And I want to hammer two aspects of that description. The first is the idea that it's practical. We think that too many ideas in diversity and inclusion, I'm sure Karen will back me up on this, are kind of in the air and kind of smell of the lamp a little bit. Uh, we insisted that uh, this is going to be a set of tools. So when we were pitching it to various publishing houses, we said, this is not a high concept book. This is a screwdriver, right? This is a toolkit right, that you can put into effect immediately after uh, you open it. And the other point is that we intend this to be entirely shame free. We worry a bit about how much cancel culture has taken over uh, diversity and inclusion conversations. And we want to shift instead to something that we call a coaching culture where the standards, don't get me wrong, are just as high, uh, but when you make a mistake, as all of us will, uh, you're given the tools and the friendliness cues that you need to achieve the standards that you set for yourself. So uh, the part that I want to drill into in the book is uh, the piece on allyship, which is really uh, the la last third of the book. We define an ally as someone who leverages their advantages in support of others who don't have those same advantages. I hope you look at this and you see yourself. You know, that all of us as human beings have some cluster of advantages and some cluster of disadvantages. That means that we can all give allyship where we have those advantages and receive allyship where we lack those advantages. I'm really happy to report that we've uh, collaborated with Microsoft to make this mandatory global training for them. This has traveled well across the world. So whether you're in APAC or in EMEA or in the Americas, allyship is something that people can get behind. Perhaps just as importantly, this has traveled across multiple contexts, not just my esteemed colleagues at uh, BTU uh, on Broadway, but also farmers in Iowa get allyship, right? We've talked to the NFL and Major League Baseball about allyship, and everyone refracts it through uh, the argot of their industry. So the actors tend to think about it as being a good castmate. Uh, the farmers think about it as being a good neighbor to the farm up the street. You know, the uh, team uh, baseball players tend to think about it as being a good teammate. Uh, to other people on their team. But everyone understands that an organization, a culture, is better if it is rich in allyship. Why is it then, we might fairly ask, that we don't see more effective allyship? And when we try to sort of close the gap between our desire to become an ally and effective allyship, we worry that we dead end in one of two directions. And the first one is that we're so fearful of making mistakes that we do nothing. So we're scared of hurting someone we care about. We're scared about getting canceled ourselves for saying something well-intentioned but inappropriate. And so we think, you know what? I'm a risk-averse, you know, highly trained professional with a career. Like, I'm just going to sit this one out you know, and let the world go by. Right? Increasingly, I think we are all understanding that this is unacceptable, right? that our silence is no longer being understood as neutrality. It is being understood as complicity in an unjust status quo. So that galvanizes us into action. But too often, when we jump in, we go to the other extreme, where we're unaware of the complexities of the situation, and we charge ahead uninformed. And this, too, deprives affected people of our allyship, because we're the kind of bull in the china shop who's engaging in unreflective allyship. What we want to do, both in the book and in this presentation today, is to equip you with the proper tools to act with confidence so you can close that gap between the desire to become an ally and effective allyship. And we think of that tool, for allyship purposes, as being this thing that we call the empathy triangle. So the empathy triangle is what it sounds like. It has a triangle piece and an empathy piece. The triangle piece has to do with the fact that every allyship situation involves at least three parties. 
There's the ally, I saw it. There's the affected person, it happened to me. And then there's the source of non-inclusive behavior, I did it. And the empathy piece of the empathy triangle points out that this is a game of musical chairs. That much as all of us would seek to sit in the ally position forever, over the course of time, we will inevitably be in all three of these roles. So even over the course of a single month, we might be the ally in one situation, the affected person in another, and the source of non-inclusive behavior, and yet a third set of circumstances. So the fact that this is a game of musical chairs should teach us all to have empathy for all three of these positions, because we ourselves will occupy them in some way. The prompts that are scattered around this triangle are an attempt to elevate every single person, no matter what role uh, they happen to occupy at the time. On the left, in the orange, we see uh, the questions that we want you to ask of yourself as an ally. In the middle, in the purple, we want you to think about uh, these questions when you address the affected person in your life. And in the green, on the right, uh, these are the questions that we want you to ask of your relationship to the source of non-inclusive behavior. So the remainder of my remarks are really going to be just going around the horn of this empathy triangle. So first of all, uh, with regard to the first set of questions in the orange, uh, do I have the proper motivation? So we all know, unfortunately, the people who engage in what the social scientists call virtue signaling or cookie-seeking behavior. So virtue signaling is where I flex to show what a great human being I am uh, by engaging in optical or performative allyship. You know, cookie-seeking is even worse, where I do it in front of Karen in order to get some tangible or intangible reward from her, the so-called <laughs> cookie. Right? Obviously, we don't want you to be driven by these extrinsic motivations. We want you to be driven by the internal motivation. So before you do anything else, ask yourself a very simple question. If nobody saw me engage in this form of allyship, would I still engage in it? If the answer to that is yes, and it has to be yes, uh, then you can go ahead. The next one is, am I informed enough to act? Right? And this is a little bit trickier because you can set the bar either too low or too high. We've already talked about setting the bar too low, where the idea is I'm gonna barrel in uninformed and realize only too late that I've raised my hand to be an ally to the neurodiverse community, and I just don't know enough about that community in order to be an effective ally. My worry with my colleagues at BTU and EY and uh, all of you uh, is not that you'll set the bar too low, uh, but rather the opposite, that you'll set the bar too high. You know, I worry that you're gonna say, you know, I am like a type A you know, professional, I'm not gonna say a word in support of the neurodiverse community until I've read the entire canon of literature on the neurodiverse community. I wanna point out that that too deprives right, that community of your allyship. So how do we split the difference in a practical way to figure out how much information we actually need? And our advice is actually quite simple, which is to say, please scale the level of intervention that you're trying to make Right, uh, to the level of knowledge that you require of yourself. So if you want to just call out an appropriate comment about the neurodiverse community, you can probably do that with all humility sitting where you are now. You can say, I'm no expert, right? so frame it like that. Uh, but that comment didn't land well on my ear. Could you please explain or reframe it? Whereas if what you want to do is a more robust form of allyship, right? like uh, trying to create a you know, panel in support of the neurodiverse community, then the lift is going to be concomitantly greater because the intervention is greater. Next, uh, am I um, thinking about systemic solutions? So here again, I don't want to set the bar too high because oftentimes a one-off solution is just fine. But from time to time, uh, I know I'm not alone in feeling like I'm playing a game of whack-a-mole. I take care of an issue, it comes back a month later, I take care of it again, it comes back a month after that. And in those situations, I want you to stop thinking about individual solutions and start thinking about system-wide solutions. So I have an example of this, unfortunately, from my own teaching, uh, where five years ago I read a really important book by Iris Bonnet. Uh, she said that male professors still call disproportionately on men uh, than they call on women in their classrooms. So I was concerned about this. I had my administrative assistant sit in the back of the room. His name is Corey Conley. Uh, and he audited me as I taught an entire semester of constitutional law. Sure enough, after a few classes, he stopped me and he let me know that I was in fact calling on men more than I was calling on women. I was mortified and chagrined and I resolved to do better and I did for about three or four classes. So after those three or four classes, because Corey is still auditing away in the back, what we realized is that when I became tired or stressed or even excited about the material, a positive emotion, I would wander right from my task of debiasing the classroom and I would fall back into my old bad habits. And in fact, this is what we know about what fighting unconscious bias looks like. It's like stretching a rubber band. 
when the rubber band is stretched, you can engage in unbiased decision making. But the minute your attention wanders and you let go, the rubber band will snap right back into place. So this is something that uh, Mazarin Banaju, who I know is a friend of EY's, you know, has sort of said in her research, which is that do not try to debias yourself by sheer force of will because you will fail. Is this depressing? Yes. <laughs> is this a counsel for despair? No. Because the author of the original book that I, uh, I was mentioning, Iris Bonnet, a colleague of Banaji's at Harvard, says don't try to debias yourself by sheer force of will, but take advantage of that moment of higher consciousness when the rubber band is stretched, and then jam in a system that will prevent the rubber band from snapping back into place, even when your own attention has wandered. So in my instance, I huddled with Corey, and our solution was a very simple one, which is I handed him the class list. He would randomize it before every class and hand it to me I was walking, as I was walking into the room, and I would just call down that list, because we realized no matter how tired or stressed or excited about the material I was, I could call down that list or I didn't deserve my job. Right? And sure enough, at the end of the semester, the audit came back clean, and I've not looked back in the five years since. So you do not need right, to always go to systemic solutions, but where you find yourself dealing with a recurring issue, you really need to challenge yourself uh, to think about this, not as something that you can overcome by the force of your own will, uh, but something that you need a system to deal with. And then last but not least uh, in this bucket, am I willing to make mistakes? And I think this is a really crucial one, and I, I hope a lovely place to end this particular bucket, uh, because the other prompts are quite stern, and this is a more gentle, compassionate one. It recognizes that we're often our own worst critics, and it says, please, uh, be more forgiving of yourself in the name of producing better allyship. So I think all of us are familiar with the difference between the growth and the fixed mindsets. This is Carol Dweck's idea that uh, the growth mindset is the mindset where you believe your capabilities are susceptible to being expanded, whereas the fixed mindset says, I either have it or I don't, my capabilities are immutable. She is found in domains as disparate as you know, uh, the business world, EY's world, academia, my world, or some other world, like athletics. I'm not sure if she studied theater. Uh, uh, the growth mindset always beats out uh, the fixed mindset. So this is so pervaded learning theory that even my 10-year-old son is not allowed to say in his fourth grade math class, I'm not good at math. His teacher immediately jumps in to say, uh, to coach him to say, I'm not good at math, comma, yet, in order to kick him from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset. He hates it, right? But it works, right? <laughs> so the funny thing that happens when we start DNI conversations is that even the most diehard proponents of the growth mindset lapse back into the fixed mindset. My colleague Dolly Chug, a psychologist at NYU, has made a study of this, and she says the reason for this is that if you make a mistake in constitutional law, big deal. I'll just assign you another case, you'll read it, and you'll probably learn more from your mistake than you learn from your successes. But if you make a mistake in diversity inclusion, that feels much more dire. It becomes not about what you did, but potentially about who you are. So you worry that you're going to get branded as a racist, a sexist, a transphobe, a homophobe, an ableist, an ageist, whatever stripe of bigot you, know, you uh, are dealing with right, at that, you know, uh, in that conversation. And that identity threat is so enormous that it prevents us from being willing to make mistakes. But of course, being willing to make mistakes is the kind of fundament of being able to adopt the growth mindset. So again, we're getting in our own way about producing good allyship if we can't allow ourselves that grace. Right? So you know, how do we get over this? You know, all very well and good to diagnose it. How are we supposed to engage with ourselves in a different way? One thing I love about Chug is she, like me, is pretty tough-minded and practical. So she has three tips. So the first one is use the comma yet strategy. You know, it works here you know, as well as it does in my uh, son's fourth grade math class. So if I misgender a colleague, the point is not for me to beat myself up and to say you know, I'm not good at pronouns, I'm showing my age, uh, but rather for me to say I'm not good at pronouns comma yet. Right? The second strategy is do not engage in slice of time comparisons to other people. Engage in stream of time comparisons to yourself. So again, sticking with that example, if I misgender a colleague, I might think, oh, you know, I can't believe I did that. You know, Kevin would never have made that mistake. Right? That may be true, but it's not helpful to my own growth. Much better for me to say, am I better at doing this than I was a year ago? Chances are that the answer to that will be yes, and it will help me sustain a growth mindset uh, regardless. And the final one is to let go of the idea, Chuck says, that you are a good person. So rather counterintuitive advice. Especially when we know uh, that all of us, as human beings, tend to divide the world into good and bad people and tend to think of ourselves as one of the good ones. 
Joke says, very natural, but unhelpful in this context, because until you make that mistake, you're going to be too complacent. When you make the mistake, again, not if, but when you make the mistake, uh, you're going to be flooded with so much self-threat uh, that you'll just collapse. So she says, instead of thinking of ourselves as good or bad people, let's think of ourselves as good-ish people, right, who are all on this journey together, and that will allow us to sustain the growth mindset, making this form of learning not different from any other kind of learning, but consistent with what we understand in all other forms uh, of learning. So the next bucket in the purple uh, is uh, the questions that we want you to ask of your relationship to the affected person. The first one is, does the affected person want help? And this may raise eyebrows because you might think, if I see a colleague or a friend of mine struggling, I'm not going to require them to come to me and beg for my help. I'm just going to jump right in and help away. And that comes from a beautiful place, uh, but I want to sort of enter a caution about it. So the leading scholar on this is Monica Schneider. She's a psychologist who writes about saviorism, or assumptive or unsolicited help. Her marquee study was about white teaching assistants who gave unsolicited help to black students on a word test. And the black students emerged with lower self-esteem and greater resentment for their would-be allies than either the black students who received no help or the white students who received the same unsolicited help. So it's not the unsolicited nature of the help on its own. It's a toxic mashup of the unsolicited nature of the help and the subordinated nature of the group. So please be careful. Right? And the takeaway from that study is please ask where you can. It will not always be possible. But if you can, go to that individual and say, I noticed and cared about what just happened. I would love to be your ally. Would that be welcome? If they say yes, you can strategize together about how to advance that allyship. If they say no, that may sting a little bit as rejection. But I want you to regard that as a huge win for allyship nevertheless, because that person has now banked you for the future. So even if they don't need you today, a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now, they can loop back to you and say, you know, I didn't need you then, but goodness, do I need you now. One thing that we hear over and over again from affected people is that they don't know who their true allies, as opposed to their optical or performative allies, are. At the point where you've had that conversation, uh, they have banked you. The next one is, does the affected person want this kind of help? So here the affected person is raising their hand and saying, you know, please, I need your allyship. So what's the problem here? The problem is that too often we substitute the kind of help we seek to give for the kind of help that is actually being asked of us. Uh, so too often we follow the golden rule of helping other people as we would wish to be helped, rather than following the platinum rule of helping other people as they would wish to be helped. So the killer study on this is done by Katie Wang. She set up a hypothetical where a blind woman, Mary, is asking two pedestrians for directions to the bus station. The first pedestrian says, that's going to be way too hard for you. You should go home. I'm not going to help you. The second pedestrian says, that's going to be challenging for you, but I'm headed in that direction myself. I'll take you there, and begins to escort her to the bus station. What Wang found is that if you ask sighted individuals who help better, they will say the second pedestrian helped better by a landslide. But if you ask individuals who, like Mary, are themselves visually impaired, they will say both forms of help were almost equally inappropriate, because the second pedestrian, like the first, was ignoring what Mary was asking for, which is simple directions to the bus station. And given that this is a community that often is told that they don't know their own minds or they can't really navigate their own environments, this came across as patronizing. Last but not least in this bucket, you know, have I considered the burden I'm placing on the affected person? This, too, causes some puzzlement uh, because people say, I'm there as an ally. How could I possibly be burdening the affected person? The answer is you can do both. You can be helping and burdening at the same time. So those burdens can be either cognitive or emotional. The cognitive one is, please educate me about your group. So in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, right, I had a black colleague come to me and say, I'm being exhausted by my allies. And he elaborated, uh, this is like having 40 of my best friends wake up after a 400-year coma <laughs> asking me to brief them on what happened in the last 400 years <laughs> to the black community. And he said, I'm in trauma myself. I'm exhausted. I realize they're coming from a good place. But that actually makes it harder for me to have a conversation with them, right? because they're coming at this with all this eagerness and good intention. And I don't want to seem like I'm being deflationary, but I'm frankly exhausted. The other kind of burden that we can place on affected people, again, with all the best intentions of the world, is the emotional one. So this is where you know, the affected person is telling you their story, right? and you have an emotional response. 
that sucks all the emotional energy away from them and toward yourself. I unfortunately had my own experience of this as the source of non-inclusive behavior, where I intended to be an ally to a colleague of mine who was just talking about an experience she had had with sexual assault. I teared up. What happens when a senior person in the room tears up? All the attention goes to them. Right? So I'm not as hardcore as Robin DiAngelo is. She says whenever she sees an ally crying uh, ally tears, she forcibly escorts them from the room. Maybe I should be, right? but I'm not. I do love something else Robin DiAngelo says, which is that the onus is on you to engage in self-regulation. So at the point where I'm having an emotional response and I realize I'm siphoning energy away from the person who really deserves it, if I'm truly going to be there as an ally, I either need to redirect and say I'm perfectly able to take care of myself, I'm having a strong reaction just because the testimony was so powerful, let's return our attention to the affected person. And if I'm not able to do that, either because I can't keep it together or for other context-based reasons, then I need to take myself out of the room and return only when I'm ready to be fully present as an ally, rather than as a distraction from the allyship that the affected person would otherwise uh, receive. And certainly, right, we've all seen the situation where in this horrible switch track conversation, the affected person is comforting the ally who's in tears, right, when the ally's role is to actually be there as support uh, rather than as a further burden to the affected person. All right, last leg of the triangle. Uh, these are the questions that we want you to ask of your relationship to the source of non-inclusive behavior. And if other pieces of this presentation of occasion kind of raised eyebrows or scratched heads, this one occasions kind of umbrage and outright resistance where people say, why on earth should I have to be an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior? That's a bad actor in the situation. I may not need to cancel them, but I can at least ignore them. And our answer to that in one sentence is, you should be an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior because someday that source will be you. Right. Again, this is a game of musical chairs. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. You yourself will be the source of non-inclusive behavior. So what culture you sustain and what grace you extend to people who err on allyship grounds in your life right, is going to make all the difference in your own life. It's going to make all the difference when you make that mistake as to whether or not you're stewing in your office alone or staring up at your bedroom ceiling, right? or whether or not at that moment you get the friendly knock on the door, the friendly text that said, that wasn't great, but I'm here for you. How are we going to grow past this together? Right. Obviously, some caveats here. You do not need to be an ally to the source, I hasten to add, in one of two circumstances. If the behavior is totally egregious, like illegal harassment or discrimination or rank bigotry of some kind, you do not need to be an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior. Similarly, perhaps a little bit more subtly, if the source has no interest in learning, which you can discern over time, uh, then you do not need to continue to bang your head you know, against that wall. But absent one of those two circumstances, egregious behavior or no desire to learn, we want you to be an ally even to the source of non-inclusive behavior and to follow these prompts. The first one is, am I separating the behavior from the person? So I think that there's a kind of relatively familiar anodyne version of this, which is, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner, don't go after the human being, go after the conduct. So if I confuse two individuals in my classroom who belong to the same ethnicity and call them by each other's names, right, we all know that the smart play is not for Shelley to come to me and say, Kenji, you're an irredeemable racist, right? but rather for her to say, Kenji, the conduct that you're engaging in is hurting your student. Right? I hope I can add some value here, though, uh, over that very familiar idea uh, in the uh, kind of guise of the psychologist Scott Pluse who says oftentimes when we separate the behavior from the person, we leave the person behind. And he says, if you can positively bring the person back into the frame, then please do that. So you have to genuinely believe it, but if Shelly genuinely believes that I'm an inclusive person, then she should say to me, Kenji, I really believe that you're an inclusive person, and that's why this behavior surprised me. That will not only lower my self-threat, but it will create a cognitive dissonance in between the person she's affirmed and the conduct that she's criticized, maximizing the chances that I'll change the behavior. The next one is actually my favorite of these 10 prompts. Am I showing that I'm learning too? It's my favorite because it speaks to something so human in us, which is a phenomenon called do-gooder derogation. And here I rely on the Stanford psychologist Benoit Monin. So Monin says, do-gooder derogation is where you fully acknowledge that somebody else's conduct is better than your own, but because you perceive them as being a do-gooder or talking down to you and judging you, you expend all of your energy trying to push them off of their high horse rather than trying to improve your own behavior. So if we stay with the uh, example, and I've confused two individuals of the same ethnicity in my classroom, right? let's say a colleague of mine comes to me and says, you know, Kenji, you know, that wasn't great behavior, so he's fulfilling the first you know, prompt. 
But then he says, this is your lucky day because I'm incredibly good at this. I've gotten all kinds of awards for being a wonderful DNI champion, and you know, I am going to make it my personal mission to make you improve your behavior, so congratulations. Right? <laughs> so we don't need social science to tell me that I'm not going to react well to that, but we actually do have the social science that tells us I'm not going to react well to that. So how should I be approached instead? So you know, I suspect right, that if I made this kind of mistake, you know, Audra would come to me and say, you know, Kenji, that wasn't great, so she doesn't need to sugarcoat, right? She can still call out the behavior. But then, in an ideal world, she would say something like, you know, but look, I did something kind of similar a few years ago, and I survived to tell the tale. In the near future, I'm sure I'll do something like this or worse, and then I hope you're knocking on my door. If the way of approaching me is as a peer rather than from on high, that also lowers my self-threat, does an end run around do good or derogation, and massively enhances the chances that next time Audra messes up, I'll be knocking on her door saying, may I be your ally? Right? So it's a kind of win-win-win there. And then last but not least, do I have a response at the ready? This is not for the source who is kind of totally kind of uh, stewing in their office and berating themselves. This is for the source, and we all know them, who's like blithely oblivious to the fact that they've done anything wrong, is just like going through their day. And it's for a particular instance of that, where you're in a large group of people, and there's a clock ticking. So let's take this session, right? If I say something wildly inappropriate, right, uh, then Karen might feel like, as a leader in the room, I need to interrupt that bias. But she has two things that are going to be obstacles to the intervention. One is that it's very adversarial, and the other one is that it's very time pressured. Right? So, you know, Karen is probably more presence of mind than I, but if I were in Karen's situation, I know that I would have the Ponce de l'Escalier, the staircase thought, where I would think of exactly what I should have said in the staircase outside of the room rather than in the room itself. So to avoid that, we actually bend one of the central rules of our center, uh, which is that in general, at the center, we say no scripts. Like CEO after CEO, leader after leader has come to us and said, just tell me what to say, and I'll say it. And we say, we don't write scripts for people. Right? This has to be from the heart. It has to be authentic. These are nuanced human interactions. We don't do that. But in this narrow circumstance where it's time pressured and there's a group of people who need to know that you've taken care of it, we're willing to bend that rule. This is our last slide. And the slide is really a menu of options, of strategies and examples. So what I want you to do is to scan down the strategies and to find something that is true to you. And then I want you to think of an example, either the one we've given or one of your own, that fits with that strategy, that is pithy, that you can memorize and stick in your back pocket. So when I scan down this list, I look at, say, something short and sharp, and I think, you know, that's not really me. Um, you know, we've already established that you know, I'm not a very adversarial person with the D'Angelo example. I also tend to be a relatively formal person. So saying something like, excuse me, or yikes, or ouch, is something I've seen other people do, but it's not something that is true to my own personality. So understanding that we're diverse with regard to our temperaments is with everything else I keep reading. So I look at educate, and unsurprisingly, as a professor, I quite like it. I feel differently about the issue, right? Uh, can I share my perspective? I also like third from the bottom, affirm their values, the uh, instance that I was uh, talking about with Scott Pluse and with Shelley. Uh, I know you care about inclusion. What you just said doesn't sound consistent with that. But I want to emphasize that I'm not carrying the brief for any one or two of these responses. To the contrary, I want you to find the two responses that most resonate with your own personality. But once you find them, I want you to memorize them. I want you to, you to stick them in your back pocket, because that will astronomically increase the chances that you will say the words in the room where it matters, rather than on the staircase outside of the room. So this has been a bit of a whirlwind tour, uh, but I hope that I've made good on my promise to give you practical, shame-free tools that you can put into effect immediately after using them. We'll circulate this menu in the empathy triangle afterwards. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I'd now like to invite the panel up. Thank you so much, Kenji. That was incredible. Um, please welcome Black Theatre United's Michael McElroy. Michael, Hello. welcome. Michael is the University of Michigan School of Music Theatre and Dance Chair of the school's top-ranking Department of Musical Theatre and the author E. and Martha S. Heron Endowed Professor of Musical Theatre. As an actor, McElroy appeared on Broadway in several productions, including Rent, Sunday in the Park with George, Big River, for which he received a Tony nomination for Best Supporting Actor in a Musical. Mm. McElroy is the founder of Broadway Inspirational Voices and served as the musical director until June of 2021. 
In 2019, he accepted the Tony Award uh, Honor of Excellence in Theater on behalf of BIV from the American Theater Wing and was nominated for a Grammy in 2005 for his Joy to the World arrangement for BIV's first holiday CD. Um, Michael is an artist in residence for the inaugural year at Little Island, Manhattan's newest public park, and a founding member of Black Theatre United. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome Karen Theronite. As EY Global Vice Chair, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusiveness, Karen drives innovations that maximize the strength and effectiveness of EY's pers personnel by embracing diversity. She oversees EY's integrated approach to diversity and <coughs> inclusiveness and EY Culture Change Continuum, a roadmap for success which enables leaders to foster an inclusive environment where people can better leverage their diverse skills, experiences, and cultural backgrounds. As a member of the EY Executive Committee, Karen co-chairs the EY Global Diversity and Inclusiveness Steering Committee and the EY Americas Inclusiveness a Consulting Council. She began her EY career as a text professional more than 20 years ago before shifting her focus to help shape the organization's talent, human resources, and DNI leadership culture. Karen works with clients and stakeholders in these efforts around the world. She earned a BSc in accounting from Miami University in Ohio, yay Ohio, <laughs> and an MSc in taxation from Fordham University. She is certified in strategic human resource management from Harvard University Graduate School of Business and a licensed CPA in New York. Welcome, Karen. And please welcome back Kenji to round out this panel. So Kenji, you talked about a lot of really wonderful things. And as I said, you have been an incredible ally and colleague working with Black Theatre United. My first question is for Michael. Ooh. Michael, <laughs> yes, wow. this event is called Making Allyship Real, Lessons from the New Deal of Broadway. Can you talk about the New Deal for Broadway and how BTU used allies to develop this document? Sure. Um, we have to go back to um, when our industry shut down uh, at the height of the pandemic. And uh, we were witnessing uh, the taking of black lives, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and then George Floyd, uh, which was the spark that started Black Theatre United. But there were also a lot of black artists within our community who were starting to speak out about some of the harms that they had experienced in our theater community. And when those conversations started to come out, there was a silence from the leadership of our industry. And then eventually we started to see these statements appearing online or on social media. Uh, but that, that gap, uh, when we heard nothing, resonated a lot louder than any of the statements that were being put out uh, from our industry leaders. And Black Theatre United made a decision in that moment to step into that gap, right? And to, instead of calling these folks out, we called them into conversation. And so in March of 2021, for the first time in our industry, we brought together Broadway theater owners, Broadway producers, Broadway creatives, which was directors, choreographers, music directors, designers, uh, composers, uh, casting, uh, and we brought represent representatives from the unions, from the actors union, the musicians union, stage hands union, hair and makeup, and the directors and choreographers, all in one space with the mission of how do we move forward, creating more inclusive environment where black artists can fully step into their potential. And we partnered with Kenji and David. And on our first meeting, uh, Kenji uh, did a, a workshop on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that we really could be centered in what our mission was and the foundation and get a, a common language for how we would move forward. And then from March 2021 until September, we met in our groups to figure out how we create a more inclusive environment. Uh, and in September, uh, we all came together one more time 
and the New Deal for Broadway was born. And uh, that's what we've been working on, and it has become a template for how we create more inclusive environments where black artists are able to step into their full potential, potential as I said. That's great, and that document is about changing our structures, our habits, and creating accountability. So much to what Kenji was talking about earlier. How are we creating structures that allow us to continue to look and see the progress that, that we need to make in this industry for the long term? Kenji, you've worked with a lot of uh, companies around the world, but the theater culture is mm. very unique. Lots of cohort groups, unions, and very, uh, various echelons of power. What specific methods did you find most effective in trying to reach and understanding with this community to help us create the document that would essentially be the gold standard of inclusivity in our industry? Great. So uh, first of all, I want to say, Shelley, that it's been the kind of honor of a lifetime, really, for me and my center to be able to play whatever small part we played uh, in the New Deal and to work uh, in a continuing way with DPU. So thank you um, all for your um, support uh, and your passion. Um, in terms of what it was like, you know, working with BTU, you know, there are times, you know, Karen, when I envied you, right, because many times when I do, but in this particular instance, I uh, envied uh, the idea that um, there would be an organization like a corporation, right, whether that's the Microsoft or the EY or the Disney of the world, that would have a kind of command and control structure that all you needed to do is to persuade the top of the house <laughs> and that it would be so. Right. And what we learned in this process was that uh, there were so many different stakeholders that there was no sort of top of the house. There wasn't even a house. Right? <laughs> and so it was much more you know, a matter of soft power and persuasion than anything else. So I would say that the, rather than a strategy, it was more like a cast of mind that David and I found most helpful, which is one of kind of radical kind of curiosity and humility. Like we knew we didn't know anything about theater. Uh, we thought, you know, as people who had worked in civil rights and then in DNI, that uh, we were more educated about the black experience than we thought we were. And the philosopher who we found incredibly helpful, and here it's the humanist rather than the social scientist who help us, uh, is uh, Christy, Christy Dotson. And Christy Dotson says, whenever you're in a DNI conversation as an ally, uh, adopt a posture of radical humility and curiosity. And if that seems too abstract to get your arms around, the tool that she uses is to say, imagine you're in a nuclear physics seminar. So it's probably just my luck that you're all sort of nuclear physicists <laughs> undergrad or something. And if that's so, like think of some other arcane subject like literary theory that intimidates you. But I think of myself as like a decently smart person. And, but when I think of myself in a nuclear physics seminar, I think like I be, better be super careful that I understand what I think I understand. Right? So I'm going to listen incredibly attentively and I'm going to share very, very tentatively. And it was really that cast of mind more than anything else that helped us kind of herd the cats right, of all these different constituencies both with regard to affected people and making sure we really understand what people were saying to us, right? not just in a theater, but uh, and not just in an industry, but a cohort that we didn't uh, fully you know, understand through our own life experiences, but also in approaching actually sources of non-inclusive behavior. I don't know if you felt this way, but I was constantly surprised by the journey people took with us, where I initially slotted them into like, you are the source of non-inclusive behavior bucket, right? but because we were able to adopt a kind of posture of radical humility towards them, we were actually gave them the space to grow. And by the end of this multi-month process, they were in a completely different space. And some of them were our most you know, staunchest uh, advocates. So, and I should say as a tag that by the end, I, I didn't, you know, in this narrow instance, Karen, sort of envy Karen, because I thought, in fact, like, this is what happens in corporations too, right? which is to say, you know, there's a limit to how much a CEO or a CDO can say by saying, make it so. Like, it has to be a culture project of persuasion. So I think that we could all do uh, a lot more with regard to that project of persuasion if we adopted the radical humility and curiosity that we tried right, to achieve in this process. Thank you so much. Karen, let's talk corporate. Um, hmm. Over the course of your career in your role as global vice chair of DE and I at EY, how do you describe what EY is doing to advance allyship? Yeah, and actually, you know, before I talk about EY, maybe just to set the context too, when you're talking about corporations, you know, corporations are um, dealing with a lot of different things. 
uh, all at the same time, and especially a lot of these things are heightened right now. Um, you know, they're dealing with polarization and xenophobia and many employees bringing that extra backpack to work with them and needing to do more. Um, they're also dealing with productivity and hybrid working and um, loneliness of their employees and belonging. So all of these things are, are incredibly important. You know, we've been a long time supporter of allyship and it's been part of our commitment for a very long time. And so with that, we include you know, things like policies and programs, um, affinity programs, allied advocate programs, and those are all really important. But we've also found that for the long-term sustainable change to the culture, like you're talking about, Shelley, and you're referring to as well, Ken, is um, to actually make it matter. And one of the things that has been really impactful for us, not only on DEI, but also on sponsorship and allyship, is actually making it matter in performance reviews. Meaning giving credit and adding value if people actually do this for others and do it well. It's not irrelevant, it's not insignificant, it's not timeless, it's, it's incredibly meaningful. So um, it, you know, it's been core for our program for quite some time, and I would expect that it's going to continue to be instrumental for us. Do you have any personal experiences of, of allyship? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and maybe I'll just share one with you of somebody that was a fantastic ally to me. And it may not be in what you might think, because I think sometimes people think you're an ally when you're a more senior person helping a more junior person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a career advancement and all that stuff. But um, about six years ago, I'll just share this one story that came to mind. Um, uh, a good friend of mine and an ally who happened to be a black woman manager that worked here. She came to my office one day and said, um, do you want to join me for a discussion tonight after hours? We're going to sit for a couple hours and we're going to talk about hair. Would you like to join me? And I jumped at the opportunity, especially to sit in the back of the room and get to listen and learn from my colleagues, not in the front of the room, is just you know tremendous allyship in and of itself. And we were discussing hair, which to some people might seem that that's in, uh, you know, seemingly insignificant topic. Well, clearly not. And I had not um, you know, lived under a rock. I knew that um, hair is, a, is a, a burden and an issue for women and women of color in society and in workplaces. So I knew about that. But having the allyship where she included me in the discussion so I was able to sit and listen was such a gift because I knew that there was uncertainty about it. But I said, but I know that we allow any type of hair. And I know that authenticity is at our core. That doesn't mean I'm suggesting we're perfect. I don't mean that at all. But I know that's a core value. And so how could this be such an issue? However, at the end of the two hours, because of her allyship and, and the participation of the entire group, I was able to understand that the tremendous anxiety and unnecessary anxiety created around lack of clarity on what we really meant by this. That, you know, being participating in this discussion allowed me to then go out of the room and very quickly update and clarify policies. So this is not about me being an ally to the effort, but this is about removing an unnecessary barrier to being very clear about all hair is welcome, all head, head dresses are welcome, anything is welcome. And we, we embrace that, but we had to be really explicit. And I don't know that I would have understood fully the level of you know, anxiety until I heard 20 women talking about, plus in the room was 200 people, 20 women talking about that they actually had lost sleep in the summer before they started with us over how they were going to wear their hair when they came here. And I was so mortified that we would create that unnecessary barrier when it's completely not necessary to spend any mind share on that when you're worried enough about starting your career or having a robust career to think that you actually have to worry about something like this. So, you know, that her level of allyship to me um, not only allowed me to do my job, but do my job better. And, um, you know, that's a gift. 
That was a gift. And mm -hmm. there was certainly, you obviously distributed um, a growth mindset that she knew that she could trust you mm -hmm. and that you had the power, you were in a position to create the change that affected so many lives. Mm -hmm. So that does show that there is a real culture here that, yeah. that allows for that. That's incredible, absolutely incredible. Certainly what we're striving for in our industry. Um, so Michael, in, in creating the New Deal, we have certainly had our pain points. Um, have there been any participants in the summit process who were sources of non-inclusive behavior <laughs> or who were skeptics of diversity, inclusion, and belonging? And, and how did you or we as Black Theatre United um, engage with those individuals and help them grow in this process as we are continuing to grow in this process? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was our first town hall, and correct me if I'm wrong, we had Stacey Abrams who said um, that these systems were built to far outlast your anger. And that has stuck with me. The theater world is just a microcosm of the world that we live in. And so all of us have been a part of these structures that have valued some lived experiences over others. And just because we got in a room on Zoom when we were shut down and started to really work through these things does not mean that once life came back into action, that people would automatically be able to make that shift. So uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated is the, the New Deal is an accountability measure, but it's done with grace. It's something that we all can buy in on and say, this is the thing that's going to keep us on the straight and narrow. Yes, we have had our challenges because people have all been, you know, we live in a space where there's an oxygen in the room that's unseen that really has been the top of the power structure. And we are asking that there be a shift. And that shift is not easy for people to make. But when we have something like the New Deal, which says, you know, here are the steps that you can take. And we have a committee, the 7G committee, that holds our signatories accountable. <laughs> so that if you're not following those things, those, those structures, those policies, those guidelines, they will reach out and have a conversation. But all in, in terms of helping you to move forward. Um, so one of the things that I just really started to realize is we're just, it's, it's the world that we live in. And we have to have that grace to say, OK, how do we keep moving forward? How do we bring people along? How do we partner in allyship um, so that we can actually do the thing that we want to do? If we you know, are canceling folks or you know, punishing them for doing, making mistakes, then we're never going to get to the place that we want to be. Um, and so when we've encountered those situations, I'm very proud to be a part of uh, Black Theatre United and watch my fellow founders dive into those spaces with grace, firm <laughs> grace. But you know, we have had to have those conversations. And they are hard. But we know what we are, we're fighting for. right? And our, we love our industry, and we know it can do better. And we want to be a part of that change. Karen, can you speak to that from EY Culture? Any challenges that you've had as you have been championing <laughs> nah. diversity? <laughs> <laughs> Smooth sailing the whole time. Totally, totally. <laughs> Easy breezy. Um, absolutely challenges. But I, you know, another thing that I think is also a challenge, and it's a challenge for me, it's a challenge for I think all of us that admit it, and it's, it touches on some of the things, Kenji, that you shared. And I, I'm humbled trying to share anything that's, that's factoids next to Kenji, because he knows all of them from all, all fancy people. Um, but that I really think that um, there's an allyship perception gap, mm -hmm. my words. Uh, you know, I don't. I'm trying to remember it as APG, and that people really think they're better allies than they are. I, I know that I've learned that as well, that I, I'd like to be the best ally I could be, but you know, there clearly are some gaps. And just some interesting studies that I was reading just in thinking about today's session, that um, as an example, white allies quite often think that they're really much better allies to women of color than they typically are. And I'm not trying to hurt white allies in the room, but it's just something to be aware of in the sense that um, the gap is something like 80% to 45, 55%. So there's a pretty big gap of about 40%. And the primary reason was that, that white allies felt like they really did their part to stand up against discrimination or bias when they saw it. But women of color had actually said what they would have preferred is someone to stand up and have allyship to help them with um, broadening out their opportunities. 
and that would be more helpful as an ally. And, and you know, the studies also show similar for gender and LGBT, gender equality and, and LGBT, in that there's a McKinsey study that also shows that um, uh, men allies perceive that they're also better allies than, than, than women perceive them to be. And that gap is something like 77 to 41% also because um, they're spending time on things that may not necessarily be as important to the woman to help them in particular with what they need versus equality overall. And I believe that a number in these studies also that uh, LGBT advocates would also say at times LGBT allies don't really understand how they can best help the individual and may make assumptions on that. So I think that perception gap does play in. Um, you know, I, I look at it as um, I don't have all the cool triangles and everything that <laughs> Kenji has, but I've learned a lot from Kenji over, over many years now. Um, you know, ask, don't assume. And really just to, you know, understand that each person is an individual and they have their own unique experiences and they have their own um, ideas of what you could do to help them as, in their allyship versus uh, labeling broad groups or making broad assumptions. Um, so I, I think that's at times what happens is you know maybe somebody reads a little infomercial or a clip and then they think that's what everybody wants and needs, and that can be quite dangerous and surprising as well. So Kenji, that kind of tees up the platinum rule. Yeah. Um, and and what you were talking about earlier. Um, can you talk about? how you apply that both to the New Deal or how you apply that to EY or your corporate clients that you work with globally? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it uh, directly follows off of what you know, uh, Karen was saying because uh, one of the things that we learned in working with um, BTU is, is really the importance of, of asking. So oftentimes, you know, we would play, you know, Shelly, you know this clip too, uh, this fake trailer for a fake movie uh, that was put out by uh, Late Night with Seth Meyers. And the trailer is called White Savior. And uh, it opens on a black woman uh, who is a kind of civil rights hero. And then immediately pivots to the man who was white while she did it. Right? And so <laughs> she's making this huge kind of moving speech. And the very opening frames are him like adjusting the mic. And he's like, I did that. You know, I moved the <laughs> mic so that she could make her speech. And, so David and I, you know, really thought about this, and you know, I, I really think that it is, you know, and I appreciated the uh, note that you sounded, Karen. It's not just like a, a white issue; it's any group that d hasn't had the lived experience of the affected people, right? So as an Asian man, I fell into this trap of saviorism, I'm sure, many, many times. And the thing that was really helpful for me and David was to try and figure out where this was coming from, because we didn't think it was coming from a bad place. Uh, we hoped, because we thought, you know. BTU entrusted us with this mission because we have skills and we have knowledge. And so if someone says, like if a producer says something knuckleheaded in a meeting uh, that we think is biased or is a misstatement of the law or you know, runs in the face of everything that we know from the social science, should we speak up, right? And part of me is like, absolutely we should. We're here to be sort of champions, right? Uh, but this is what's known as the champion assistant dilemma, right? Because if you ride in there as a champion, and the affected person doesn't want that particular form of help or doesn't want the meeting interrupted, uh, then that's really unwelcome, right? Uh, and so there you're really meant to be an assistant and not to fall into the uh, Seth Meyers character's uh, trap. So how do we thread the needle between being the champion and being the assistant? Because obviously each role is gonna be appropriate at different times. And I think that the really simple answer is ask, right? You know, pick up the phone, you know, talk to Lashan, you know, talk to Tamara, talk to Michael, talk to Shelley, right? Uh, they're actual people who have the answer to this question of how they want to be helped. So have those conversations with them. And we get pushback from time to time saying, well, wait a minute, that seems inconsistent with you're not supposed to cognitively burden the people that you're trying to help. And fair enough, right? But our rule is, I think, a very simple and true one, uh, which is you should only ask somebody for information when they're the affected person if they are the only people who hold the information. So it is not OK for me to go to Michael and say, educate me about the last 400 years of what <laughs> happened to you know, uh, African Americans and history. Right? But it is OK for me to go to Michael and say, like, ah, oh, that producer just said a totally knuckleheaded thing. What would be our most helpful response you know, in terms of my center mm -hmm. right, to that producer? Do you want me to stand down, or do you want me to go in with my studies and my law and my expertise in order to assist you? Right? So it's not as intractable a dilemma as I think it's often characterized to be, but it is a dilemma. Yeah, yeah. 
But it seems like what you're proposing is a very hopeful set of solutions that include, that allow everyone to grow and to mm. hopefully achieve something that, that feels very real and tangible and creates change. So that's very exciting. Michael. Yeah, please. <laughs> What does truly inclusive theater look like to you? I'm sorry, I'm just stuck on what Kenji just said. I was, I was, I, I, I just want to touch something that he just said that um, I feel like this work is kind of like the English language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where there's an exception to every rule. Mm. Yeah. And I think so often when we're dealing with DEI and, and uh, we want to have, what is the exact step that I do to get there? And there's always an exception. There's mm. always, I mean, and it's because we're human beings, right? And that human interaction is, is, is individual and unique. And so um, that was just something that came to me in the moment. Sorry, sorry, what was your question? Yeah, just, you know, if you could imagine in your mind, obviously, you know, you've been in the business for a long time, we've all been in the business yeah. for a long time, and, and know what it has been. Mm -hmm. But in your dream, what does truly inclusive theater look like to you? What do you imagine it to be for you to bring your whole self and everyone to do that? Wow. Um, I can't even imagine that. Um, I think. I long for, and working with students in this next generation of artists, mm -hmm. um, I long for a time where people can actually be viewed for the unique, fantastic <clears throat> human beings that they are and the talent that they bring in the room, and that the talent wins the day, right? That there, that, <coughs> but also that there are, is access and pipelines. What we found during uh, the shutdown was that there were so many areas within our industry where there was little to no diversity. One of our BTU's, um, in, our internship program with them, all the advertising marketing firms on Broadway is because of that. And we're in our second year now. Um, so there should never be a space within our industry that is not touched by many different lived experiences. Um, I, I feel that the more diversity, the more ideas that are at the table uh, will give birth to a kind of art that we haven't even imagined possible. Mm. Right? And that's what I, I, I look towards. And that's what I challenge my students when I'm when I, um, working with them in class or having meetings with them is to think big. Yes, meet the industry where it is now, but I want you to be thinking about what it's going to be five years from now and be ready for that. And I want, I want our industry to be open and, 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 and uh, make space for every beautiful story and experience in every field within our industry. Um, and I think the work that we're doing is starting to kind of crack that open. Um, it's going to take time, um, but I, I do believe that we are headed in a, in a really wonderful direction. That's beautiful. I want to I want to work in that that space yeah. for sure. <laughs> Karen, I know that EY has begun to explore storytelling in your own way. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, it really had a ripple effect across the world and across our world. We're in 150 countries, and we have about 410,000 employees. And we knew that we wanted to do more, not only in our communities and our ecosystem, but to do more within ourselves. And um, we wanted to explicitly add equity to our uh, mission in addition to diversity and inclusiveness. But what did that really actually mean? Which means we had to do a lot of work on systems, on intended barriers, processes. And this work is well underway now. But we also knew that we wanted to build awareness around, well, what does equity actually even mean? And what does it mean in a corporate context? And how can people build their own skills around this and their own awareness? Because, you know, while even even words like you know race can't be used everywhere. We certainly know racism and discrimination exists everywhere and across many different capacities. And we wanted to be very clear in our stand um, against that. So we developed a campaign internally, and we call it Uplift for Social Equity. And um, this is not, I'll be very candid, this is not an ad campaign. 
This is not a campaign that EY's nailed it, we've done it, we were all the best in all these things. Absolutely not. This is about we want to make sure that all of our people are as aware as possible of different starting points and different experiences and how that contributes to this organization and that we want everyone, not just some people, everyone to have the ability to thrive in their careers with us. So we developed this campaign um, around storytelling of our people's experiences. And we started with uh, 12, 13 videos. And you know, we're basing storytelling, I'll quote a professor, Dr. Aker, who says story, stories are 20, 22 times more memorable than facts. So the reason we thought we would share some of our people's stories in their own words with our people to raise awareness. Um, why don't we share one of them, if that's OK? Can we share Joseph Apong's video, please? This will just give you an example. I grew up in Ghana. I would say it was a fairly safe environment because everyone was like me. I remember vividly coming into the U.S. I went into a grocery store. All of a sudden, people were looking at me. I was like, why is everyone staring at me? That created this uncomfortable emotional state. My engagement teams would be like, you're very quiet. You, you, you never say anything. But it was that internal struggle, right? The more I became aware of my surroundings, the more I became aware of um, some of the prejudice. Where is my voice? How, how would people hear what I'm saying? Do they really understand who I am, where I'm coming from? The killing of George Floyd created great sadness um, at the times, just fear. There was a lot of things that I began to think about. Even when I was going for a run in my community, I was looking around, making sure that no one was following me. The world is full of imbalance. And there are instances where you may have more than the next person. Human nature is such that you want to be part of something. You want to be seen. And so being seen is, is really, truly remarkable. People that truly bring that authenticity to conversations, to interactions, creates a bond. Removing barriers comes in different shapes, sizes, different complexities, bringing my talents and my background, things that made me comfortable into the workplace. I do think that people are beginning to understand the complexities of being black in America, or black, frankly, anywhere. We're all here, hopefully, to make the world a better place. We can do better. Um, we can make the world work better. And it starts with one person at a time. of this is just to share that these are our videos taken of our people. They're not actors. They're our people. And in their own words, we didn't t tell them what they could, they could talk about anything they wanted to talk about. And of course, they're very special people. Um, but the, the goal is to build awareness and to share experiences and to start a conversation. So that's really the piece of this is to start conversations on teams and to learn more about others and to engage in that dialogue. We've been given permissions to share this um, externally here and there as well because we also think it's important for everyone to engage in this conversation because I think, as Joseph said, we can do better and we want to do better. So this is um, a big launching pad for us. And um, I'm pleased to share that, that you know we've gotten uh, stats back that People are really receptive to it and really open to it. And people also want to do better. And so um, we're not alone in that. And we're very happy about that. So thank you for letting us share that. That's beautiful. It, it's the, 
it's the thing that we have been doing for years, which is you know telling a story mm -hmm. and knowing that there is an opportunity with the stories that we tell if we tell them with integrity and honesty and mm -hmm. authenticity that we can grow humanity. And um, we've dedicated our lives to that in the mm -hmm. theater industry, and it's really beautiful to see that ripple out into the corporate world. Kenji, you've been talking you know, for years. You talk about sharing your story and the power of that. Can you give some examples of, of the power of sharing your story? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a little bit abashed to be talking about storytelling with a you know, room full of professional uh, storytellers. Uh, so, and I've been speaking a lot, so I'll be, I'll be really brief and um, trying to uh, add a kind of allyship, sort of leadership lens to this. Um, Shelley, I think that the most kind of compelling uh, brief story that I can tell is how I open my classes now, which I shamelessly stole from the colleague I mentioned earlier, Dolly Chug. So the first slide I put up when I'm introducing uh, myself to the class is, here's a day in the life of a professor. You know, this professor sort of misgendered uh, a trans student. This professor confused two people of the same ethnicity and confused them with each other and repeatedly called them by each other's names. This professor assigned a syllabus that uh, was stacked towards people uh, who were male or of dominant groups of other kinds without any kind of explanation for why that needed to be so. You know, this professor laughed repeatedly at you know, inappropriate jokes. And, you get where this is going, right? The next slide is a picture of me, right? And I think that that is such a critical leadership capability to sort of open the space by saying, I am the source from time to time, have been, will be, right? And I want to be better. I want to be held accountable for this. And it creates the space not only for other people to call you out or call you in, right, and to let you grow, but it also creates a psychological safety in the room where others are also permitted to make mistakes to get better and to extend themselves and each other grace as they do so. Yeah, when the person with the most power in the room level sets at that space, it certainly does empower everyone else to feel like they have the grace to make mistakes and know that it is a safe space. So thank you for that. Is there anything that you would like to impart to the group before we open it up to questions? I just want to see what other people want to say. Yeah. Great. Well, let's open it up to everybody. Welcome you in. Any questions? Hi, I'm Avery. Nice to meet Hi, you. Um, so I go to a performing arts high school. I'm majoring in musical theater right now. Mm -hmm. And so I had a question about like college auditions, kind of. <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any advice for me going back to like the theme of allyship about how I can keep like a very positive mindset like about myself and about other people when I'm going through my musical theater audition process because I know it can get like very competitive mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That's a great question. Avery? Yes. Um, the thing that I tell students, high school students when they're auditioning for college is one is to choose material that you love and that speaks to something that you're passionate about. Don't try to second guess what the people on the other side of the table want, mm -hmm. because what they want is you, right? I think there's a lot of information in the audition process, um, specifically information about that institution. So when you're looking at potential programs to go to, look, if things are important to you, like diversity is important, look at the faculty, right? See who's teaching, who has been given the right to teach the students. Right? If you look at the brochures, or brochures, I'm dating myself, but if you go online, <laughs> you will see every student of color in you know, all of the, the pictures. Right? But I always you know, advise students to go. Go to their campus, talk to students, ask questions, and also when you go in that room, also realize that you're auditioning them. How they deal with you, from the person that greets you when you walk in the door, um, to the monitor, uh, to the faculty that are in the room, that's all information. And so, so often students look at it as, I have to do something for them, but they're gonna be the person that you're gonna be working with for the next four years, right? Um, so be passionate about and choose material that you love. Realize that you're auditioning them as much as they're auditioning you. If you can, go to the campus and really talk to some students who are in that program, right? and see if the things that they have said online are actually happening when, when, and when you walk around that campus. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Chong from Can You. I have a question for, for all of you. How do you know when it's working? So what do you use as the key PI or the success metric to know that allyship is truly really working within your organization or BTU? I can, I can tell you as a director, um, every week I, I sit down with the cast and I do a check-in. And I keep the room open and I chat with the cast and I say, how are we doing? Is there anything that we need to discuss? Because I want people to know that it's important to me and the fluidity of life can change and the temperature of the room can change. So we keep communication open and just let them know that their lived experience, what happens on the other side of the door, when they walk into the room, all they bring all of their humanity with them. They don't have to check that on the other side. So I do lots of check-ins to make sure that everybody's doing okay and let them know that they're valued. And if they're not, that we're creating a, a, an environment that can support them. That's new for our industry. And it's just something that we're employing because we realize that it's not just the art that we have to make, we have to value the artists that make the art. So we're trying new things. Yeah, I would say that it's actually what Karen was saying earlier about the delta that exists, you know, of like allyship being given and someone's perception and allyship actually being received. So, in fact, if you ask uh, individuals when they've offered allyship, like a huge percentage of people will say yes. If you ask affected people uh, if they received effective allyship, that number will drop significantly. And then if you ask sources if they've received allyship when they've aired, that number will drop again, right? So for me, success looks like when you've closed all those deltas. And it's like if someone believes that they're extending allyship on a routine basis, and other people will also feel that. Uh, and when you ask them to report on that, you know, as Shelley uh, is in her way doing, and I do uh, in my both formal and informal ways, it's when that gap closes. And allyship is not just the ball that's being thrown, but it's the ball that's being caught uh, that you feel like uh, things are, are moving and changing. And I guess I would just add from a corporate macro perspective, you can measure, um, and I know, I'll give you an example, we measure quarterly key metrics for every single business unit. And um, it actually matters how people score. So we measure, um, I feel included on my team, I, I feel like I belong, I feel like I feel free to be myself. Um, there are allyship questions in there, there are other environmental questions, there are equitable staffing questions, so things like that. And then this way we know are we going up, are we going down? who's up and down, who's bouncing around. We take a look at their overall scorecarding and, and we look at who's leading and how the decisions are being made in those departments. So you can get a temperature check anonymously, but at a macro level. And so, as I mentioned, that's something that we would look at quarterly and we've been doing this for a number of years. And um, it's been very helpful because people then strive to treat this like other business metrics. Mm. And it's not treated as off to the side. It's just as important as your other things that you are being valued and uh, you're being judged on as a business, not like a, a passion play. And um, that has been significantly important in building up the resiliency of the culture. I think for us as actors, we're so used to keeping our heads down and doing the work. Um, but as an organization, we're doing the work and then every once in a while we get a moment to kind of stop and look back and go, oh, when we look at our marketing internship program, oh, students are actually being hired at the firms where they, where they intern. Oh, you know, we start to see it. Um, and so for me, for our organization, for Black Theater United, it's in those moments of conflict that people trust us enough in spaces to be honest and open so that we can move forward. And also in those moments when people come to us, not to partner because of what they think we will be, but really to be in genuine community and allyship, um, so that because they believe that we can be a part of the change. Those are the moments, conflict, um, looking back, and also people wanting to be with us in community. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Naya Owens and I'm a rising sophomore at Smith College. Um, and my question is for all three of you, for all four of you actually. 
Um, and it's about, I guess it's two questions, but the first is about how do you call in, and you guys touched on this, but how do you call in larger groups of people when they do not see themselves as needing to be called in? Because I find often at my college, there are lots of students with privilege, including me sometimes, who there are spaces made for them or events created to talk about privilege and to talk about problems that we're facing. But the students who do need to show up do not, and the students who have already heard the issues show up all of the time. And then the second question um, is then, as you do call those people in, at my school there really isn't that much diversity um, and racial diversity. So what that means is oftentimes the few students of color who are hosting those spaces are the same students having to exhaust themselves making the efforts to create the space and open the space up. And so how do you then not exhaust yourselves with the efforts of calling people in without feeling like you've given up on the source? Thank you. That's a hard one, <laughs> it really. Uh, uh, at my university, we have two groups uh, that are really exploring you know, privilege and what it means to be an ally to each other. And what we have found that um, has worked or been the most successful is when students who share that identity have done the work. So if we have a group of students in solidarity of white students who are exploring how to be better allies, them doing the work to reach out to their fellow white students does not put the burden on the black students to do it or other students of color. And so using them and allowing them to stand in allyship and also they communicate, keeping communication open between all students to say, what do you need? It's especially what Kenji said, it's like, how can I support you in this moment? You know, and when students speak up and say what they need, then uh, we have found that the best way to handle that is to let students who share that identity go and work with their students to get them to come into conversation. I guess I'll just, uh, Kenji probably has a perfect answer for this, but um, <laughs> I don't. But I would, because I think it really varies and each situation, it's, it may sound very time consuming, but requires an individual and unique approach um, in, in my experience. And I think people only come along when they're really ready to um, I don't really, it hasn't, it's not so effective in my view on a smack model. I find that positive reinforcement works quite, quite a bit better. Um, and I think what really changes people is when they see things through other people's eyes. And I think the most effective way to bring people along are um, people care deeply about their colleagues, right? They care deeply about their teammates. And if they experience something through their eyes or they join them for something, that ends up becoming life-changing, far more important than anything my CEO says on a webcast or that I might say you know, on, on the website, right? I mean, maybe somebody cares, but probably very few. What they really would care is, what do you as my colleague think is really important? And did this move you? And what was your experience? And thank you for inviting me to come with you. Those have been life-changing. And they've been instrumental in, in transitioning the whole culture up and over together. Um, so I would say, you know, positively experiencing things together and bringing more people with you as you're experiencing it. Yeah, I love this question. And I think it's a beautiful place to uh, end um, after Shelly uh, gets her response, because I do think that the answer is really allyship. Right? Uh, so the one thing that I think has really changed in the past 10 years in the diversity and inclusion space is the rise of allyship. So Matt Iglesias, a political writer, I think nailed it when he said, we're experiencing the great awakening, and I used woke there in its original positive sense rather than its uh, distorted contemporary pejorative one. Uh, and what he says is what's different about this moment is that non-black people are going to Black Lives Matter rallies. You know, men are going to the Women's March in Washington. Like straight and cisgender people are showing up in ever greater numbers for the LGBTQ plus community. People who are able-bodied are supporting uh, the community of people with disabilities. Right? And so that's different. Right? And I think that that's where the promise is, where people are waking up to the fact that all of us have these buckets of advantage or privilege uh, and are willing to spend down some of that privilege in the name of a more equitable world. Right? Uh, and then that also, I think, alleviates a burden uh, that you're so rightly uh, pointing, um, putting your finger on with regard to affected people being exhausted. Um, we know right, not only that I know it's not just a question of numerosity, that allies are more numerous than affected people uh, in any cohort, uh, but also that um, 
allies are more effective, right? This is a Heckman and Johnson work, right, that says, you know, if I speak up for a group that I don't belong to, I'm much more likely to be uh, heard and much less likely to be hurt uh, than someone who speaks up who belongs to the affected group. So again, you know, I, I really appreciate the question because I think it brings back full circle, right, why this panel and why allyship is such a critical topic. So I think that this is the hope, right, for the future, that we can actually feed this movement uh, across all different uh, demographics. I love this question too so much. And the first thing that I thought about was, um, especially during the last couple years, especially after George Floyd died, I spent so much time trying to grow my circle of education that I lost sight of my joy. And so I would say, you know, among your cohorts, Think about the things that fuel your joy and that allow you to shine. And then when people ask you what they can do for you, make sure it's about not spending all of your energy and time trying to get them to where they need to be, but that you are growing who you need to be so that the, the light that you can bring to the world can outshine the darkness. That you are always putting into yourself whether it's your art, whether it's your, you know, whatever it is, that you're surrounding yourself with people who are doing that for you and with you. And that is more important than growing their understanding. Let them find their way to you, but don't stop your journey to get them to catch up. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Kenji. I know, you know, I learned a lot today, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, all of you, for your questions. And I think we get to like chat with each other for LaShans. a little while. No, LaShans. Oh my gosh, yes, LaShans is going to close us out. My dear friend LaShans is the president of Black Theatre United. And with a career that has spanned 31 Broadway seasons, LaShans consistently brings women of complexity and triumph into the cultural lexicon. Yes, she does. Mm -hmm. LaShans won a Tony Award for her performance as Celie in the Color Purple, originated the role of Timoon in Once on This Island, which changed my life. And had a Tony nomination for that and upheld her commitment to artistic excellence this past season as Willetta in Alice Childress's historic play, Trouble in Mine, Tony Ward nomination there. Other notable stage performances include Summer, the Donna Summer musical, Tony Ward nomination, A Christmas Carol, The Secret Life of Bees, If Then, The Wiz, Ragtime, Uptown, It's Hot, and Dream Girls. On screen, she has delivered memorable roles in both TV and film, including Handel's Messiah Rocks, A Joyful Noise, Emmy Award, East New York, The Blacklist, Melinda, The Help, HBO's The Night Of, Law and Order, SVU, The Good Fight, Sex in the City, and the Disney animated film Hercules, among other titles. Recently, LaShans has received Tony nominations nominations, plural, as a producer for both the 20th anniversary revival of Susan Laurie Park's acclaimed Pulitzer Prize winning play, Top Dog Underdog, as well as Kimberly Akimbo, a new musical by Tony Award winning composer Janine Tesori, and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright David Lindsay A Bear. She is the president of Black Theatre United, a community of creatives dedicated to awareness, accountability, and advocacy. She is a proud mother, and she resides in Westchester with her cats and gardening hats. Thank you. Stand, I'll stand here. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, which is on my website, which is probably where they pulled it from. Because <laughs> <laughs> I would not have had you listen to all of that. <laughs> But thank you for that introduction. I just have to say, I am so proud of what we experienced here today. I mean, I like to think that I have an awareness because I've gone through this training with Kenji and because I am black and I think that I know a lot of things about what it feels like to have biases, but I also sit here and I think that's me. I also experienced so many of these biases and I have to check myself. So it's really, it's really wonderful to continue to hear this. And, and now that we know that we do have your toolkit, which is 
share, say the right thing, correct? I think we should all go out and get Kenji's book so we can have our toolkit when we know what we need to say and know how to say it properly. So I just want to thank you all for attending today, for joining us, those in the room and those online. And, um, and oftentimes we walk away with, from these types of events and you know we allow the purpose of what we experience to escape us. And that is why we invite you to take one of these cards with you and remember to scan the QR code so you can discover many ways that you can also can stay connected with Black Theatre United, learn of our upcoming events and our ongoing initiatives. And we'd like to also thank EY for being such partners <laughs> with Black Theatre United. <laughs> Kevin and Molly have Woo! been Woo! our champions. Yeah! And we at Black Theatre United are so fortunate to call you partners because we really do feel a partnership and an ally and an allyship with Ernst and Young that we have not felt as an organization to date. And we're so grateful. Thank you to so many of your staff members that have been helping us. I'd like to thank our executive director, um, Ketia Ming, and our, our managing director, Morgan, for also helping to arrange everything that you've seen and experienced here today. Thank you, continue to stay woke in the right sense, <laughs> right? In the correct sense of the word. And we ask and we look forward to seeing you at the reception and any of our in our upcoming events. Please check us out on blackdayunited.com. Thank you. Thank you all.